which brings us to the Latin Mass. Ah. You love the Latin Mass. I do. Uh, you're very involved in Latin Mass circles, promotion of it. You grew up evangelical, Church of England. How do you make that progression to understanding the history of the Roman Rite, the traditional Latin Mass? I mean, you are, you are really speaking my language right now. Um. <laughs> well, you want to continue in Latin, we can do the rest. <laughs> We can conduct the rest of it. You're the an Oxford the, guy, so we could just go Latin. Yeah, no, look, I mean, let's do it. Let's do it. No, I'm joking. Um, it's actually not something that's very well known about me, which is that, so Michael Knowles and myself, who, are, you know, Michael is one of my closest friends. Yes. Um, and He's a genius. He is a great guy. What celebrity would you be super nervous to meet? Michael Knowles. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, we, we talk absolute nonsense. We also talk very deep doctrine. We talk everything from the early church all the way through to modernist philosophy. Um, and he has nicknamed me, which I think is entertaining, and I have various nicknames for him, but he has nicknamed me the, uh, the trad Catholic king of Nashville, right? oh. Um, oh. Which, I, which, I, which is probably the only sort of moniker that I actually take yes. on any, as, as, with any seriousness. The theological reasons that I think it's important is because, first of all, we're talking about something from the early church. This is not something that just came about as an aberration in sort of the fifth century. This is something that was very early. Uh, the church took it very seriously. And it's also, it's the church pre Babel. It's the church pre, I love that. you know, pre Tower of Babel. And normally when I go to a, a foreign place, one of the first things I do is look up the Latin mass yes. because it's something that I know that I can get wherever I am. It's, it's something that I know that if I look up, I can walk into it. I can feel very familiar with it. It is the church without the vernacular. And that, that, and that sounds ridiculous. Like mm. that, why would you want the church without the vernacular? Right. And actually the, the point being is that because it is the universal church, mm -hmm. like that's actually the truth of it. The church, the church in one language is the universal church. That is true Catholicity. That is true Catholicism. Catholicism means universality. Yes. Like that is what we're really aspiring to. Um, and so for me, the Latin Mass is a is a is kind of the emblem of that Catholicism. It is the the flag bearer for that yes. Catholicism. Secondarily, I think that it is something which is incredibly beautiful. And that was also something, again, my background, my conversion. I came from a church which using that illustration from earlier, you know, kind of like the Protestant church between, you know, sort of Applebee's and, and Buffalo Wild Wings, you know, it, it, I, I had no liturgy. I had nothing to aspire to. I had no beauty. I had no, you know, kind of adoration. I had no sacramental theology. For me, I came into the Catholic church. I was enamored with the liturgy. I was enamored with the contemplative orders, the monastics, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I was enamored with 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 something that took Christ beyond my basic comprehension. Right. I actually think that the Latin Mass gives glory to God in a way which is a little bit beyond human comprehension. And that for me is incredibly important because yeah. God is beyond our comprehension. Like God is not supposed to be understood. Like if you think you can understand God, you're completely wrong. You know, he's he's actually beyond our comprehension. He's the mystery of the Trinity. He is the mystery of God made man. The Latin Mass gives glory to that. And that's what I love about the Latin Mass. The Latin Mass is beautiful. It is adoration in its highest form. It is sacramental theology in its highest form. It is universality in its highest form. And as Pope Benedict XVI said, you know, what has been considered perfect for many ages cannot, I'm paraphrasing here, but what has been considered for perfect for many ages cannot be considered now to be incorrect. You know, yes. and, that, and that for me, when I became a Catholic, was a very, sort of, it was, it, was, it was the gong, you know, it was the bell which was rung. And, um, and so for me, that is the Latin Mass. That is the beauty that I appreciate in the Latin Mass. To me, the Latin Mass shouts at me, this is not your performance. Mm. This is not you. I am being drawn into the eternal sacrifice of the Lamb of God to the Father. Yeah. And I come, I am welcomed, 
as an outsider and I'm brought into this mystical reality, but I am very much there, not as a, I don't know, I have to be very careful about the language here because there's all idea of active participation, but my active participation in the mass is not me being a functionary. Yeah. Right? My active participation in the mass is interior. Yeah. And it, it Protestant worship, and in some senses, the Novus Ordo worship, you can forget, you can begin to believe that I am here doing something for God. Mm. When you're at the Latin Mass, there is something foreign, something elevated, something transcendent that constantly reminds you, and as a father of eight kids, I think teaches your children that you are here primarily to be interiorly attached to the mystical offering of Jesus to the Father. Yeah. And that strips away things that are cheesy, things yeah. that are cringe. And I think it strips away from us any hint of Pelagianism that we have. Yeah. That we are here, I have this bundle of prayer and worship that I am going to rocket launch to the Father. No, it's going to have to go through this mystical action at the altar through him, with him, in him, in Jesus Christ. And in that sense, it is humbling. Yeah. And I can see in a modern world, especially in the 60s, with all the optimism, and, it's, mm -hmm. and we could say pride, that somehow that wasn't good enough. We had to tinker with it. Yeah. And the Latin Mass brings us back to this, and the Eastern Rites as well, the yeah. Byzantine Rites, same thing. You, you come there as a foreigner, and then you're brought into the table. Yeah, I, I want to think of myself as an active participant, mm -hmm. but as Pope Pius X said, the Mass is the most holy form of prayer. Yes. You know, and that's really how I think of it. There are great sections of the Latin Mass where you're not expected to, where the laity is not expected to say anything. Yes. You know, we sit, we 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 kneel, right, and we watch, and we watch the priest consecrating the host. We watch the priest consecrating this offering to God as part of God, making manifest what God has made manifest to us. Yes. And that is incredibly beautiful. And during that time, I, you know, I, I know the Latin. I also know the English. You know, I pray in my own mind, Lord, make this manifest to me. Yes. Lord, make this manifest so that I understand what you are doing for me right now. You know, Lord, bring this to your to a reality for myself you know that for me that's very important you know that that is making it manifest for myself that is making it real in my life you know it's not it doesn't it doesn't become an academic subject it doesn't become a liturgical conversation it becomes it becomes a reality and we're seeing and, and you're very involved in this work globally the movement catching fire and this is in africa yeah, Asia. It's not just in America and France anymore. Yeah, hundred percent. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, and I think that's a that's a. I mean, I'm very excited when you when you say things like that because it makes me very happy. But um, yeah, look, I, as a convert, as somebody who came to the Catholic Church from you know kind of very low church evangelical background, I I I'm very excited by the movement into mm -hmm. the Latin Mass. I think it's very very important. I think it's something that um, we as Catholics have to encourage, and I. I I'm very much of the opinion that as the world loses its appreciation of the sacred, it's going to move to things which are increasingly sacred. And that's kind of where I am with Latin Mass. You know, I think that the world has begun to appreciate the Latin Mass more and more as we've degraded our culture, as we've become, you know, kind of more and more culturally um, degenerate in many ways. Yeah. Like, you know, and I've, I've made this point before that you know, wind the clock back kind of 1500 years, you had debates in the market of Constantinople about the nature of Christ and right. wind the clock forward 1500 years and you have Cardi B and Lizzo, you know, kind yes. of these, these are the sort of two illustrations. Like we're supposed to be getting smarter. We are technologically definitely smarter, but we're also culturally much less smarter. We're much less sophisticated now than we were. I think that the human soul requires something as beautiful and as sacrosanct as the Latin mass. And this is something that our, our kind of our society, the converts, 
uh, the church as a whole is growing towards because they appreciate the beauty of something as sacred as the Latin Mass. And this is something that I'm very passionate about and very involved with and, and obviously want to grow and, and help and help flourish. You know, I, I, it's, if I get to the end of my days and I sort of look back on my life and I think Christ, or, Christ calls us to be bold soldiers for him. You know, what, what did you do for me? Will I be ashamed of you? You know, when you when you reach the gates of heaven, will Christ be ashamed of you? I hope that I can, not in defense of myself, because I'm saved by grace, saved by works, saved by what he's done. But I definitely hope that when I get to the gates of heaven, I can say I actively promoted, you know, sort of, I gave glory to you by helping bring others to the faith yes. through this liturgical celebration of your body, mm -hmm. your your death on the cross. That That is something that I can earnestly bring to him. Take my life, take my life as a fragrant sacrifice for you, but let me give glory to you mm -hmm. through bringing other people yes. to the Latin Mass. Yes. It, it's a very good point you make about how the world becomes less sacred, and so that we are going to have to seek those yeah. sacred places. And you know, this raises all these questions of communion on the hand versus communion on the tongue, vernacular versus sacred languages or sacral languages is the better term um vestments music yeah chant architecture yeah preaching all of these things it's almost like in the 1960s we said well, let's try it to be a little bit more relevant and if you look at the numbers and the demographics it didn't, it didn't work, work out, out. And as the world got more and more secular, it sort of, in a way, dragged down that project. Yeah. And now there's this renewal, and it's all over the world. It is the church at the dawn of time. Liturgy, chant, all these things bring us back to the early church. It is, it is exactly what we require in this modern age to get that continuity with the early church. And that, for me, is very, very important. It's something that I, I think is, as I said, lost in this modern age. I think it's, it's something where we've completely lost our affiliation with anything sacred, with anything early in the, as an early church. I think we've lost any affiliation with that. We've got bishops, priests um, who are, you know, kind of 1960s, 1950s, 1950s, 60s onwards who who think that by updating the vernacular updating the liturgy we're going to bring more people into the church and actually that's not what the church is about no. you know christ christ is not about trying to be accepting to all people this is a popular misconception he's actually he says himself people will hate you yes people will despise you yes. people will think you're evil you're wicked wars will be waged in my name mm -hmm. you know this is this is the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is that it's divisive. It's it's a revolution. It is a revolutionary language that Christ yes. Chesterton himself writes this. He's like, this is a revolutionary language. You know, it's a revolutionary language where we will bring freedom to the captive and liberation to the slave, but not in the way that you think it will be brought. This is not about a human revolution. This is about an eternal revolution where you're freed from sin. Yes. Um and that's actually what kind of the old church got so right, yes. and um, which was the Church of the Martyrs. It was, yeah. And we've and we've and we've somehow sort of, you know, we've we've adapted that. We've tried to make it more popular, and I I don't think that's the right that's the right angle personally. Yeah.